In the summer of 1988, a wealthy Jackson, Mississippi woman disappeared from her home in broad daylight. The only clue left behind was a mysterious ransom note. The FBI and local police struggled to find answers in its cryptic message so they could find the kidnapper and retrieve the victim before her time ran out. daring kidnapping and a bizarre ransom note baffled Mississippi authorities. The victim was the wife of a wealthy businessman. A list of 12 names and a few drops of blood were the only clues to her fate. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. The ransom note gave the FBI its first leads, but the case was not so clear cut. Solving it required the keen insight of a criminal profiler, and the perseverance of a family, local authorities, and the FBI. Six AM, July 26, nineteen eighty eight. The heat of a midsummer day would soon bear down on the southern city of Jackson, Mississippi. Like every weekday for the past 48 years, Annie Laurie Heron had coffee with her husband, Robert, before he left for work. As early investors in oil, the Herons had become one of Mississippi's wealthiest couples, with a fortune estimated at more than $100 million. That day, Annie Laurie Heron would host her bridge club at home, the same house where she raised two children and lived with her husband since they were newlyweds. By 3.30, Mrs. Heron's bridge game was over and her friends had left. The housekeeper finished cleaning up after the card game and checked if Mrs. Heron needed anything else. The 73-year-old woman said everything was fine. Annie Heron planned to spend the rest of her afternoon reading until her husband returned. She wasn't expecting anyone, but perhaps one of the bridge players or the housekeeper had forgotten something. Her husband wasn't due home for an hour. Hi, how are you, ma'am? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? Good. You got to see your husband. I have a letter. I'm back to see him. I'm not on my way at all. Let me Annie Laurie Heron was on her own. At about 4.30 that afternoon, Robert Heron returned from work. Annie, I'm home. He saw that his wife wasn't home and figured she was out with her friends or daughter. When she hadn't returned by 5.30, he thought it was strange that his wife of 48 years hadn't called or left a note. house seemed to be empty. Annie. Robert grew concerned and began calling family and friends. Uh, anywhere that I can tell. No one had seen no, Annie the since the bridge game. The maybe, uh, maybe we're going to have to do something else. Thank you. Robert's son-in-law, who lived nearby, said he would be right over. The son-in-law said he and his wife hadn't heard from Mrs. Heron that day. Robert Heron pointed out that when Annie left the house, she usually took her purse. But his wife's purse and shoes sat beside her reading chair. Her newspaper and glasses were nearby. You know, we're just... I, I just don't know what to say. Robert was worried since Mrs. Heron's medicine for a chronic intestinal disease was still in the bathroom. 
She would need to take it soon or she would not be able Let's to absorb food. Again. The men continued to search for some indication of where she'd gone. A piece of paper near the front door caught the son-in-law's eye. It was a ransom note without specific instructions. Annie Laurie Heron had been kidnapped. We've got to do something real fast. The note demanded that Robert Heron pay 12 separate men before 10 days passed, but it didn't say how much or where to send the money. He was ordered not to call police, so he waited for a ransom call with instructions on getting his wife back. When none came by nightfall, he contacted the Jackson Police Department despite being warned not to. Officers secured the ransom note, hoping to keep any fingerprints intact. Processing the house for evidence, officers discovered a trace of what appeared to be blood on the front door frame. Laboratory tests would later reveal that it was blood and that it matched Mrs. Heron's blood type. A Jackson police detective interviewed Robert Heron. They wanted to know if he or his wife had ever been threatened. He had no idea who would want to harm them. If Mrs. Heron were without her medication for long, her intestinal condition would become critical. Kidnapping is a crime that must be solved quickly, or the chances of rescuing the victim are slim. That evening, Jackson police contacted Special Agent Patrick McGlennon of the FBI's Jackson Field Office to bring the resources of the federal government to bear right away. Under the federal kidnapping statute, the FBI has jurisdiction whenever an individual is, uh, is kidnapped in the United States. Uh, the presumption in this case, of course, was uh, a kidnapping had occurred, a ransom demand had been made, and uh, the possibility of travel interstate is, in fact, why the FBI gets involved in these types of matters. The FBI called U.S. Attorney James Tucker, who would advise investigators in legal matters as the case developed. Like most residents of Jackson, Tucker had great admiration for the Herons. Robert Heron was a self-made man, and uh, at the time of this incident, which was uh, 1988, uh, Mr. Heron was probably considered one of the m foremost uh, financial wizards uh, uh, here in the Jackson area. Uh, he was well known in, in the business community. Uh, he was uh, uh, a generous person, so he was becoming uh, well known for his particular acts of generosity. By dawn the next day, FBI agents and evidence technicians arrived at the Heron's home. The Jackson police detective filled in the case agent on what they'd learned so far. The FBI set up a satellite command post at the residence and tapped the Heron's phone ready to trace any ransom calls. There was little doubt that multi-millionaire Robert Heron was the real target. Yet Mr. Heron hadn't been told what to pay to get his wife back. It was impossible to comply, or nearly impossible to comply, with the demands because they were nonspecific in nature. Mrs. Heron was not even mentioned in the note. There was no provision for her safe return. The note did say that the 12 men listed had been involved in the same photography company. Robert Heron explained that he had once served as chairman of the board for that company. Some of the company's franchisees had been sued to recoup losses, but Heron did not know which ones. It seemed unlikely that the 12 men named had kidnapped Mrs. Heron. But perhaps one or more of them was striking back at the company through Robert Heron. Technicians collected samples of all the writing pads and paper in the Heron's home. They would compare the paper to the ransom note to see if it had been written on the stock from the house. The results would take a few days. 
see what was going on. Investigators searched outside the house for hairs, blood, clothing, anything that might reveal the kidnapper's identity. They looked for cigarette butts or evidence of food or drink, signs that someone had been watching the house. They found nothing. And yesterday afternoon, Neighbors and domestic workers reported seeing nothing strange at the house the previous afternoon, and no one had seen Mrs. Heron leave. The next day, agents continued canvassing the Heron's neighborhood. Dr. Posey? They questioned a doctor who lived down the street. He said that he had seen something in the neighborhood recently that might be related to the kidnapping. Two weeks earlier, the doctor was going to run errands when he drove past a white van parked near his house. From that position, anyone in the van would have a clear view of the Heron house. Hey, Brown here? Yeah, about 50 At first, the doctor thought nothing of it. But when he'd returned home hours later, the van was still there. Thinking the driver needed help, the doctor offered his assistance. Can I help you with anything? I'm wondering if you need some help. Yeah, the driver responded by asking if there was a law against parking in the neighborhood. It was an odd response, enough to make the doctor remember the incident. Thank you, sir. He said the van drove away minutes later. Agents continued to canvass the Heron's neighborhood and found another neighbor who had seen a white van on the street three months earlier. The other neighbor had seen a van similar to the, that described by the first individual sitting almost directly in front of the Heron residence in the very earliest days of April of 1988. Uh, she was suspicious enough of the van to get the license plate number. If investigators could find that van, they might also find Mrs. Heron. But a computer check revealed that the license plate had been stolen from a car at the New Orleans airport. It was another dead end. After 36 hours of investigation and no ransom calls, agents hoped lab results on the note would provide a fresh lead to Mrs. Heron or her abductor. FBI examiners first determined that the note had been typed on paper foreign to the Heron's home. They also compared the typeface to known samples from every typewriter made in this century. The laboratory division was able to determine that the demand letter was in fact typed by a royal typewriter manufactured between 1912 and 1927. There was nothing else contained on the demand letter which would give analysts any type of ability to tell us the manufacturer of the paper or whether there were any indented writing or other evidence on the letter. A latent fingerprint examination revealed nothing, and a spot on the note believed to be a bloodstain was too small to analyze. Although no evidence on the note helped agents, they hoped its message would. The note demanded that Robert Heron pay 12 men who were involved with a photography company. Perhaps the kidnapper was among them. Agents learned that the company had foreclosed on each of the 12 men, all former franchisees, to collect heavy debts. One of the company's executives provided the FBI with company files and photos of those men. Are you going to have to take those with you? Yes, sir. One was now deceased. The others were scattered throughout the country. Thank you. Yes, sir. At the FBI's Jackson Field Office, agents split up the 11 names and began to review the files and photographs. They sent leads to FBI offices in the towns and cities where the men currently lived, requesting additional information. Agents found that many had financial troubles. They tried to ascertain if those men had traveled near the Heron neighborhood when the white van was spotted there and again recently when the kidnapping occurred. FBI agents across the country began covert surveillance on the former franchisees, 
They hoped one of the men would lead them to the ailing 73-year-old woman. But as the kidnapping investigation stretched into its third day, only seven days remained on the ransom note deadline, and agents still lacked instructions on how to recover Annie Laurie Heron alive. Hi, how are you, ma'am? Three days had passed Good. since Annie Laurie Heron, an elderly grandmother, had been abducted from her Jackson, Mississippi home in broad daylight. The FBI continued surveillance on 11 men named in the ransom note found inside the Heron's home. Agents couldn't confront the men. A frightened kidnapper might harm the victim. Special Agent Patrick McLennan hoped one of them would lead to the missing woman. We wanted to determine if they were traveling even small distances from their residences or business. Uh, we wanted to see if they perhaps were keeping Mrs. Heron at a uh, remote location where they might have to provide food, water, other conveniences for her, that they wouldn't want to be too far away from the victim. Despite the efforts of dozens of agents around the country, they discovered no direct leads to Mrs. Heron's whereabouts. But they still resisted contacting the 11 men directly so as not to reveal the investigation. The FBI considered the possibility that the kidnapper might be someone other than the men listed on the note. Agents contacted the Behavioral Science Unit at the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia for assistance. Profilers in the unit are agents trained to determine characteristics of criminals from the details of a case. One profiler reviewed the evidence, particularly the ransom note, looking for indications of the kidnapper's psychological makeup. The profiler called in his findings to the Jackson FBI agents working the Heron kidnapping. Do you mind if I put you on speaking fence so we can all listen at one time? In the conference call, the profiler confirmed that the kidnapper was likely one of the 11 suspects currently under surveillance. And since all those men had at least some college education, he believed one of them had intentionally misspelled words and used an old typewriter to throw off investigators. The profiler said the abduction was an act of revenge against Robert Heron by a paranoid individual who was willing to kill. The Behavioral Science Unit believed that a sole perpetrator was responsible for this crime, that it would be a white male of approximate middle age, and that the individual would probably be working alone, although if they were working in concert with someone else, that person would, would provide a very subordinate role. It's bad. The profiler also concluded that by this time, there was only a 50% chance that Annie Heron was still alive. One further detail caught the profiler's eye, a phrase that did not seem to match the rest of the note and might point to the profession of the kidnapper. The note said, pay them whatever damages are owed to them. If any is dead, pay their children. Damages was a, is, a, is a legal term. It was telling in that one of the individuals on that demand note was an attorney. Special Agent Tom Montgomery of the FBI's Jacksonville, Florida office was called in to investigate the attorney listed on the note, a man named N. Alfred Wynn. After we received the name of N. Alfred Wynn, we did the public record background checks. Uh, we also contacted the St. Petersburg Police Department, the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office, found that he had no criminal record, did our own computer checks also. Uh, we determined that he was a St. Petersburg attorney and that he lived above his office. What's this all about? Well, I'm investigating a crime. An agent went to interview Wynn at his office residence. Alfred Wynn said he had nothing to do with the kidnapping and explained where he was on July 26th, the day Mrs. Heron went missing. He had been at a bar with a prostitute. He said that on that evening, he had called his paralegal back at the office. He asked the employee to meet him at the bar to lend him $100 so he could go home with the prostitute. We get 
big time. How about you? The paralegal promised to be right over. Wynn said he and the prostitute went outside. He stalled for time as he waited for his paralegal to show up with the money. The two were in Wynn's car when his assistant arrived. Wynne took the money, then left with the prostitute. Wynne said he didn't remember much about the evening. He didn't know the name of the bar or the prostitute's real name. The next day, agents checked the alibi with Wynne's paralegal when the attorney was out of the office. He corroborated his boss's story and also claimed that he didn't know the bar's name since he had never been there before or since. Agents suspected both men were lying. We learned that Wynn had paid for the paralegal schooling at a local community college, uh, his paralegal schooling. Uh, we had learned that uh, he was working for basically a very uh, minimum salary and there was a lot of allegiance between the paralegal and, and Mr. Wynn. Um, talk to girl, Later, an agent re-interviewed Wynn's paralegal, explaining their suspicions. He maintained that he had met Wynn at the bar on the same day of the kidnapping, though he did reveal something new about his boss. He said that Wynn's legal battle with the photography company had begun when the company foreclosed on him seven years earlier, and that he had fought the lawsuit with a vengeance. He had attempted to declare bankruptcy three times in order to avoid paying his debts. Under a court order to recover the money, the U.S. Marshal's office had confiscated Wynn's valuables, including 1,000 shares of expensive stock. They also impounded Wynn's European sports coupe, a car the paralegal said Wynn loved. In addition, they put his St. Petersburg office up for auction. On July 6, 1988, less than three weeks before Mrs. Heron disappeared, Wynn had been notified of an eviction hearing. But he had refused to leave. The paralegal said that Wynn had been furious, believing that the photography company had ruined his life. Going to get that date for me. You're going to check that date. The FBI wondered if the paralegal had been involved in the kidnapping. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. We pulled all vehicles registered to the paralegal, friends and associates of Mr. Wynn, to include Mr. Wynn, and learned that the paralegal had a white van registered to him. And through an interview of the paralegal, learned that the vehicle was utilized by Wynn on several occasions. It seemed to be a major breakthrough in the case. The vehicle identification number revealed the name of the previous owner. An agent went to interview her. She said Alfred Wynn, not his paralegal, had been the actual buyer. She said that Wynn had acted strangely. He was adamant that his name not be written on the title. So the woman left the line for the buyer's name blank. The lead was promising, but then agents learned that the van had been in the repair shop on the day of the kidnapping. Okay, the, uh, okay how long was he gone? It was one more frustration in a difficult case. After more than a week, the FBI and U.S. Attorney James Tucker were no closer to finding Mrs. Heron. A case like this is extremely difficult when you don't have an eyewitness to any one of several situations. We did not have an eyewitness as to the abduction itself. We did not have an eyewitness that, that Newton, Alfred Wynn, or any of the other people listed in the particular note had ever been in Mrs. Heron's company. At the Jackson, Mississippi police station, 
Investigators again met with the doctor who had seen a white van in the Herons' neighborhood. They hoped he could recognize the driver in a photo lineup. The neighbor quickly picked out the photo of Alfred Wynn. He was certain it was Wynn he saw reading a map in a white van across the street from his house in mid-July, less than two weeks before Mrs. Heron's abduction. The other neighbor, who had seen a similar van, also identified Wynn as the driver. It was clear to agents that Alfred Wynn was connected to the kidnapping of Annie Laurie Heron, yet they didn't know how. Thank you very much. We thought, because of the positive identification, that Wynn was definitely somehow involved in the kidnapping. If not the actual perpetrator, if not the man who walked up to the door and actually grabbed Mrs. Heron, he certainly was directing or calling the shots. Yep. FBI yeah. agents kept Wynn under surveillance. They believed that he could lead them to the missing woman. But as the deadline in the ransom note approached, hopes of finding the frail Mrs. Heron dimmed further. The day after the deadline in a ransom note, FBI agents and local detectives briefed the husband of kidnapped Jackson, Mississippi socialite Annie Laurie Heron in preparation for a televised appeal for his ailing wife's return. The note hadn't outlined specific steps to earn Mrs. Heron's release. FBI behavioral profilers hoped the press conference would prompt the kidnapper to contact Mr. Heron with instructions to get his wife back unharmed. With his son and daughter at his side, Robert Heron asked anyone with any information to come forward. As a businessman. He also spoke directly to the kidnapper, promising to follow any specific instructions. A week later, the plan seemed to have worked. On August 15, 1988, Robert Heron spotted the familiar handwriting of his wife among his mail. The envelope was postmarked August 12th from Atlanta, Georgia. Investigators were careful not to destroy any evidence that might have been left on it. Mr. Heron believed the letter was in his wife's handwriting, too. FBI lab examiners later confirmed that it was. In the letter, Mrs. Heron begged her husband to do what the kidnappers wanted, or they would seal her up in a cellar with only a few jugs of water. Though the letter provided no instructions on how to comply. For Special Agent Patrick McGlennon, it did bring new encouragement just when all hope of recovering Mrs. Heron alive seemed lost. When we received the August 15th letter, which was in Mrs. Heron's handwriting, it really lifted the spirits of everybody that was involved in the case. We felt reasonably sure that she was in good enough condition to write the letter, and we were going to get her back the same way. The letter itself had been dated August 10th, 15 days after the abduction. Yet no one could be sure Mrs. Heron was alive on that date. It was unclear if she had written the letter on her own or if the message was coerced, according to FBI Special Agent Tom Montgomery. Certain words utilized on the letter seal me up in the cellar with jugs of water. In talking to family members, we found out that those are not words that she would normally utilize. She would have used the word basement or bottles of water. So it is our belief that the letter was dictated to her. If the letter had been dictated, both the message and the date could be false. Having to guess at what exactly he should do, Mr. Heron wrote checks to all the men listed in the original ransom note, according to U.S. Attorney James Tucker. He had already instructed his people to make efforts to determine what financial situations he had had with each of the people that were listed in the original note. So he had some idea at that particular point about how much money had been involved with, with each of those people. Mr. Heron settled on restitution, roughly equivalent to the amount the men had been ordered to pay in their franchise lawsuits. 
The total came to almost a million dollars. Heron sent $145,000 to the prime suspect, Alfred Wynn. Enclosed with each check was a note requesting the safe return of his wife. The FBI instructed the Postal Service to deliver the envelopes the next day. Later, agents spoke with Wynn's paralegal and learned of the attorney's reaction to Mr. Heron's check. When Mr. Wynn received his check in Tampa, Florida, he opened it, read the contents of the letter from Mr. Heron, turned to his paralegal and stated, this is not what I wanted. He told his paralegal that what he had wanted was to get his life back, the return of his confiscated car, jewelry, and other property. Wynn sent back the check with a note enclosed, saying he hoped Mrs. Heron would be returned safely. Agents now believe that Alfred Wynn had kidnapped Mrs. Heron for revenge against the photography company Heron once chaired, not for monetary gain. That meant it was less likely Mrs. Heron would ever be returned alive. Although some of the people receiving checks kept the money, most returned similar responses. Some of the people that Mr. Heron sent these checks to sent the checks immediately back to him, sent letters or called on the telephone, expressing their regret to Mr. Heron that something like this could happen to his wife. They wanted nothing to do with the money, and they weren't going to benefit through his grief. Two and a half months passed without further word from Annie Heron's kidnapper. Considering her fragile health, chances were slim she would survive this long. In early November 1988, the case was featured on a national crime-solving television series. Agents around the country chased each of hundreds of leads called in. One call from a woman in Florida seemed especially promising. Although none of the names on the ransom note had been broadcast, she said that if Alfred Wynn were on the list, she had important information. The FBI learned that the Florida woman was a spiritual advisor, which did not initially bolster confidence among agents. But after a brief interview, they realized she had a strong reputation in the law enforcement field, having often assisted police in the past. The advisor told an agent she had first met N. Alfred Wynn four years earlier. In 1984, he had his first consultation, asking her advice about problems he had with the head of a photography company, the same company mentioned in the Heron ransom note. Tell me about it. She instructed him to pursue his problems through the court system and take legal means, and he told her that he had already done that, and it just didn't work. That's the big problem. That is the biggest Wynn problem. Wynn said he wanted to kidnap the head of the company and hold him hostage until he got what he wanted. He had the perfect place to put the man and said that he was looking for someone to help him. He called her a month and a half later to ask if she would help. She declined. The advisor provided the FBI with records of her work with Wynn. Once assured agents would protect her, she agreed to become a cooperating witness and promised to contact Wynn to arrange a meeting. FBI technicians would wire her office for sound and video. Our plan was to draw Mr. Wynn into a face-to-face -face meeting with her and to have them discuss their prior discussions of, of this kidnapping of Mr. Heron, as well as any of the other things that would verify exactly what he had said to her during their prior meetings. Alfred Wynn took the bait. Suspect the monitored meeting took place in early December 1988. FBI agents watched as Wynn approached the office. Agents hoped he would reveal the whereabouts of the missing woman. 
The advisor told Wynne she had seen the crime show on television and asked if he had kidnapped Annie Heron. FBI one, can you hear him in there? Wynne denied it, adding that he had decided not to abduct Robert Heron as he had previously discussed with the advisor. The recording corroborated the advisor's statement, but it didn't provide agents with the evidence needed to arrest Alfred Wynne. When Wynne left the office, FBI agents followed him. We hoped a meeting between Mr. Wynne and the psychic would lead him to, at the very least, check on the location of Mrs. Heron's body or lead us to a co-conspirator. But the suspect never went to visit a place where the body could have been kept. Weeks later, agents learned that Wynne owned a cabin in Florida's swampland, a perfect place to hide a body. Dead or alive, agents hoped they'd find Annie Heron there. They had no way of knowing if the house was booby-trapped or if someone was armed and waiting inside. Six months after 73-year-old Annie Heron was kidnapped in Mississippi, FBI agents hoped to find her in a remote Florida cabin owned by prime suspect Alfred Wynne. The message from the kidnapper had threatened that the elderly woman would be sealed alive in a cellar. But agents found no cellar. The police was empty of anything related to the kidnapping. FBI Special Agent Patrick McLennan and other investigators continued searching for the kidnapped woman nearby. We began to look in dry cisterns, some swamp area adjacent to those properties, the outbuildings, screened porches, whatever structures existed. We found no sign of Mrs. Heron, and no sign that anybody had ever stayed there for any length of time. Certainly no cellars. There were no cellars in that section of Florida. Annie Heron was still missing and presumed dead. Then, in late July of 1989, Alfred Wynn sent a filing cabinet to the IRS, challenging them to find disputed financial documents. All right, guys, we got the file cabinet with it right now. Wynn from the IRS. But he failed to check the cabinet thoroughly, and his arrogance would bring him down. Wynn, we believe, sent those thousands of documents to Internal Revenue Service as part of an effort to intimidate them uh, into leaving him alone. Uh, that, was, uh, that was a pattern that the agents discovered in regard to when conduct in, in a number of situations. Uh, he, his arrogance was demonstrated in his efforts to overpower whoever he was involved with at any particular point. When they found letters regarding a kidnapping and murder plot, IRS agents called the FBI. The documents outlined how Wynne and a former girlfriend had been planning to kidnap and kill the woman's husband. According to FBI Special Agent Tom Montgomery, the similarities to Annie Heron's abduction were obvious. They mentioned utilizing an old typewriter to type a communication, and the first ransom note for Annie Laurie Heron was typed on an old 1920s vintage typewriter. They also mentioned detailed maps, uh, surveillance of the area. They also mentioned that it was actually Wynn that was going to do the crime. And the female was just going to help him and obtain what he needed. FBI agents tracked down Wynn's ex-girlfriend at the community college where she worked. They needed to question her about the plot outlined in the letters. At first, she claimed she knew nothing about the plot. But when reminded that interfering with an investigation was itself a crime, she decided to cooperate. When the last time you saw him was a few years ago? She said the plot to kill her husband was Wynne's idea. When she realized he was serious, she had broken up with Wynne. Agents asked if she had had any contact with him since then. She said that a year earlier, in early August 1988, Wynne had asked her to meet him at a motel in Deland, Florida, 
It was just days after Annie Heron had been kidnapped. Wynne acted paranoid, silently handing her a note that asked if her car was bugged and if she'd been followed. When he was convinced it was safe, he began talking. What's this all about? Wynne asked her to mail a letter for him, offering her $500 plus travel expenses. First of all, did I touch it? She agreed, and he paid her half in advance, $250. Wynne handed her an envelope wrapped in a gray linen napkin. Then he gave her very specific instructions. She was not to touch the envelope or even look at the address. Wynne ordered her to mail it from Atlanta, buy the airline tickets under a false name, and fly into and out of two different airports. He instructed her to change her appearance before the trip. She complied, changing her clothes, jewelry, and hair in the women's restroom at the airport. Once in Atlanta, she was to mail the envelope precisely on August 11th. But the woman told agents it was late in the day when she made it to a mailbox. At the last moment, she said she couldn't resist a glance at the address. The letter allegedly sent by Annie Laurie Heron was postmarked on August 12th from Atlanta. Have you seen this agents photograph? showed the woman a photo of the envelope Robert Heron had received. She immediately recognized the distinctive handwriting. It was the envelope she had mailed. Do you have on this? I'd like to clarify. She said that she had thrown away the napkin used to carry the envelope on a rural road. Thank you. She offered to take them there once she finished work. That evening, she brought the agents to the area. Investigators knew there was little chance they would find the napkin on the roadside after more than a year, but they looked anyway. They needed it to corroborate her story. Against all odds, they found it. But they wanted an admission in Alfred Wynn's own words. With a solid cooperating witness, agents were getting closer to arresting Wynn. At the FBI's request, Wynn's ex-girlfriend agreed to be wired for an audio tape meeting between herself and Wynn. We had hoped that Mr. Wynn would discuss facets of the crime, that he would tell her what she had accomplished by sending the letter to the Heron residence, that he would thank her for her help, that he would pay her. The woman called Wynn and set up a meeting. Agents had instructed her to try to draw Wynn out about the trip to Atlanta. As hoped, Wynn gave his ex-girlfriend the $250 he still owed her for mailing the envelope. Wynn refused to talk in detail about his plan, and he never mentioned Annie Laurie Heron. He seemed to have stonewalled investigators again. Convinced he was involved and desperate to find Mrs. Heron, the FBI knew they had to arrest Wynn soon. On March 11, 1989, the FBI was ready to arrest suspected kidnapper Alfred Wynn. They set up a second meeting with Wynn's former girlfriend who had begun cooperating with authorities. The ex-girlfriend had been wired so agents could record the conversation. They hoped Wynn would say something incriminating about the kidnapping of Annie Heron, so they could charge him and recover Mrs. Heron or her body. FBI Special Agent Tom Montgomery had coached the informant on how to deal with Wynn in this crucial second meeting. We had instructed her to become more aggressive in this meeting, 
and to basically indicate to him that she was aware that she was involved in, in a criminal act, that she'd been watching television, and that uh, she now realized that the letter that she mailed may in fact be in, involved in the kidnapping, may have been a second ransom note, hoping to elicit from him something to incriminate him further. Agents watched and listened as the woman pushed Wynn about the Heron kidnapping. The suspect soon became defensive and left the car without admitting any knowledge of the crime. Okay, let's go, let's go, let's go. Agents knew it was time to make their move. element of surprise is critical to a safe arrest. Alfred Wynn was charged with conspiracy to kidnap, mailing a threatening communication, and perjury for testifying in front of a grand jury that he wasn't involved in the kidnapping. But agents still had no solid proof that he or an accomplice had in fact abducted Annie Heron. In Wynn's car, agents discovered several maps of Mississippi, one with a Jackson exit marked on it in pen and notes in the margin. Agents thought these might indicate where Mrs. Heron's body had been placed, but extensive searches yielded nothing. Securing a warrant, Florida FBI agents searched Wynn's office. They needed physical evidence to prove Wynn was involved in the abduction of Annie Laurie Heron. Their hopes rose when they spotted a vintage typewriter. Special Agent McGlennon recalled that FBI examiners had determined the ransom note was typed on a 1920s era royal typewriter, the exact model recovered from Wynn's office. This seemed to be a very significant break. In my mind, this was the typewriter upon which Wynn typed the initial demand note that was left in the Heron's home. We sent it to the lab, fully expecting them to come back with a report saying, this is the, the exact typewriter that composed that letter. The FBI lab determined that the typewriter found in Wynn's office was not the one used to type the ransom note. Agents believed Wynn had planted a different typewriter to bring doubt to later prosecution. They had also found a business card for a van rental company in Wynn's office. How you doing? The company Major, owner said Alfred Wynn had rented white vans three times. Behind the manager. Okay. Each time he had driven more than 500 miles, uh, yes, just 100 miles more than the round trip to the Heron's uh, residence. Yes, I do, but I don't have a the rental times did not coincide with the date of the abduction but one did match the date when Alfred Wynn was cited in the Heron's neighborhood. U.S. Attorney James Tucker had little evidence to prove his case. He believed that Wynn and his paralegal were lying about the suspect being with a prostitute on the day of the kidnapping. We went back and confronted the paralegal with this false alibi. The agents and I had a heart-to-heart -heart talk with him, at which he decided that he better tell us that all that was a lie and that, uh, and that uh, Mr. Wynn had, in fact, been out of his law offices and out of pocket during the entire time that, uh, that the abduction occurred, which would have been the crucial dates, the 24th through about the 28th. This would help prove perjury, but it wasn't enough to charge Wynn with the crime they were certain he had committed, the kidnapping and murder of Annie Laurie Heron. The federal trial for conspiracy to kidnap began in Mississippi on January 29, 1990. Throughout the investigation and the two-week trial which occurred in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, Wynn professed his innocence. But at the conclusion, a jury of his peers found him guilty for the crimes for which he was charged. N. Alfred Wynn received the maximum sentence allowed, 19 years and seven months for conspiracy to commit kidnapping. 
he has no chance of parole from the federal prison in Coleman, Florida. We have never to this day resolved where Mrs. Heron is now. And the family deserves to know that. In fact, as far as this office is concerned, we still carry this as an open matter and will continue to do so until such time as uh, somebody steps forward and uh, helps us out with locating where Mrs. Heron is. Family deserves it. Mr. Robert Heron died of a heart attack on November 28, 1990. In May of 1991, Mrs. Annie Laurie Heron was declared dead to allow the settlement of the couple's estate. The Heron family still hopes to someday learn what happened to their mother, to begin to heal their pain, and to finally lay her to rest.